Hi, this is Robert K. Elder. I am co-author of Hidden Hemingway, and you are watching Mr. Media. I'm Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You can see, hear, and read more than 1,000 of my previous celebrity interviews at mrmedia.com. That's mrmedia.com. Subscribe to the show on YouTube, iTunes, Apple News, Google Play, or Stitcher, and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. On today's show, I'll welcome back writer Robert K. Elder. His latest book is Hidden Hemingway, Inside the Ernest Hemingway Archives of Oak Park. And this is his fourth time on Mr. Media. Stick around. If you've ever been to one of the Disney theme parks, you know that a hidden Mickey refers to sightings of Mickey Mouse in unexpected places. For example, you can find classic Mickey locks hanging on the cabinets behind Captain Jack Sparrow in the treasure room to the left of your boat on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride at Disney World, according to the website HiddenMickeyGuy.com. Now, that said, if you come to my guest Robert K. Elder's new book, Hidden Hemingway, inside the Ernest Hemingway archives of Oak Park, thinking it's that kind of story, you'll be disappointed. Note to the author. I got a great idea for a sequel. <laughs> Hidden Hemingway is, instead, a deep dive into what is apparently an endless collection of Hemingway family documents, souvenirs, letters, and ephemera dating back decades. Elder, along with co-authors Aaron Vetch and Mark Serino, have sorted through stacks of Hemingwayana to, st to share everything from baby pictures and high school memorabilia to Papa's handwritten letters to his own Papa and his membership card from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Even if you've read his novels and or Carlos Baker's exhaustive biography, which I did, there is plenty to fascinate any Hemingway fan here. And Robert K. Elder, welcome back to Mr. Media. Hey, Bob. Thanks for having me. Hey, delightful to see you. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been eight months since we were sitting out in somewhat chilly weather uh, down at Stillwater Tavern in uh, downtown St. Pete. I was, I was going to say, I don't normally associate Florida with chilly weather, but it was lovely. It was great. Ah, uh, yeah. You're just, okay. So you've got a guy here from Chicago on one end of this uh, this conversation and a guy who's been living in St. Petersburg for 30 plus years. So they have two different ideas of what's uh, lovely weather. Uh, mm -hmm. For him, it was you know it was in the 50s, I want to say, that day, and uh, it was very comfortable, probably wearing shirt sleeves, and I'm wearing a jacket. But <laughs> it was very nice. We got to meet for the first time, and for a guy who's been on four times, I think it's appropriate that we, it's great. we it's break great. bread together. 80% uh, yeah, so comic book talk, so it was great. It, it was a lot of comic <laughs> You're right. It was a <laughs> lot of comic book talk. Uh, and uh, speaking of which, since you told me this ahead of time, uh, let's jump to comic books. You actually wrote a story for the Comics Journal about Ernest Hemingway and comic books. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean, so th this book um, sort of lends itself to falling down rabbit holes, and I absolutely fell down a rabbit hole that's actually not in the book, believe it or not. Um, I, for the Comics Journal, I documented over 40 appearances of Ernest Hemingway in comic books. So he's met everybody from, you know, Superman to Lobo and Jenny Sparks, he even shows up in Cerebus. So uh, I tracked down a lot of the authors, a lot of the artists and talked to them. And uh, yeah, it ran in two parts in uh, the Comics Journal. So it's, it was a lot of fun, but it was a little exhausting. Did you talk to Dave Sim about uh, Hemingway and Cerebus? I did, I did. And he actually, he's the end of part two because he has a very controversial take on Hemingway's sexuality, because if you look at that last, it's one of the last arcs in uh, Cerebus called Form and Void, um, he does this whole, how shall I say, he does this whole um, research bit about uh, Mary Hemingway, his fourth wife, and her African journal, um, and it really, really digs in, and uh, at a certain point, uh, draws Hemingway with women's lingerie on. Because he believed that Hemingway was a bisexual, really? um, and uh, the one of his posthumous novels, *Garden of Eden*, proves that. So it's a really, really interesting exchange. Uh, everything that comes out of Dave Sims' mouth is ter terribly interesting. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. Yes. I, I remember talking to him for the Eisner book, and it was just like, okay, yeah, this is interesting. And everything I've read about him has always suggested that this is a man with a unique take on pretty much everything. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, but he, he was very kind to me. Yeah, I, I got to ask you about one of them. Tell me about Ernest Hemingway and Lobo. Uh, actually, he shows up in Lobo as a Greek chorus of authors. It's an Alan Grant uh, tale, so it's like him and Mark Twain and Shakespeare. And the whole joke is they're just padding for the book, so they provide <laughs> they provide this sort of like meta commentary. And at a certain point, they get to the end, they're like, "Wait, there's the story's over, but there's three more pages to go." And and they realize they're padding, so it's 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 a lot of fun. You gotta love a good Greek chorus. I do. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think my favorite had to be the Three Mice in uh, the Babe movies. Oh, that's right. I didn't think about that. I yeah. didn't think about that. There's also a Woody Allen film with a, a, a Greek chorus. Um, is it uh, Everyone Says I Love You? Is that the one? Uh, I didn't that, see that. That might be why I don't know. It's got uh, the head of the Greek chorus is uh, F. Abraham Murray. Oh, jeez. Was that the musical? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I I just on 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 just general grounds, I decided I did not want to scar scar myself by watching a Woody Allen musical. It has Goldie Hawn, and there's a whole Groucho Marx number. Uh, it's worth your time. Yeah, I don't know if you're selling me or not here. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that we've found, particularly when we sat down and, and had a meal together, was that in, that we have in common is that as writers, uh, there is no topic too eclectic for either of us. No, you can say geeky. It's fine to say geeky. All right, geeky, if you will. <laughs> um, I, and I, your pre, I think we mentioned, but your previous uh, visits to Mr. Media have been to promote a website of love stories and books uh, as varied as uh, Last Words of the Departed, The, ex- the, the Executed, yep. uh, uh, influential uh, films of uh, uh, films that influenced uh, famous film directors. Yeah, the film that changed my life. Right. Uh, and uh, now... Ernest Hemingway's archives. How did the fickle finger of fate land you? Speaking of Goldie Hawn, how did the fickle finger of fate land you at the Ernest Hemingway archive at Oak Park, which we should mention is in Illinois? In Illinois, yes, yes. Uh, Just curiosity. All of my books are books that I would want to read. So um, I uh, had been the editor in chief of a a string of newspapers, a chain of newspapers called Pioneer Press. One of them was the Oak Leaves, which is in Oak Park, Illinois, where I live. And Oak Park is famous for uh, a few people. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, he had his home studio here. Ernest Hemingway and Edgar Rice Burroughs, who is the creator of Tarzan and John Carter of Mars. Um, And if you want to throw in like Kathy Griffin, you know, (laughs) there's there's a couple other people as well. Now, there's Uh, an interesting Greek chorus. Yes, yes, and Thomas <laughs> Lennon, and uh, I think Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio. So the, oh. it, it's it's a really interesting sort of uh, alumni we have here. And they all went to the same high school, uh, not at the same time, of course. Uh, but the interesting thing was Ernest Hemingway actually delivered the Oak Leaves. So I found myself editor-in-chief of a paper that he had delivered. Mm. So we did this really interesting sort of research project because it had been rumored that he had written for the Oak Leaves. Not true. When he was wounded during World War One, they published one of his letters, which is not really the same. Um, and I went through this archive, which had um, love letters from Agnes von Karowski, who became the model for Catherine Barkley in A Farewell to Arms. Um, it had letters uh, to him and from him and these rare family photos, like photos that no one had ever seen. And you think Hemingway, I think, is the most documented author since Shakespeare. And all of the stuff that people hadn't seen. So I went to the Ernest Hemingway Foundation of Oak Park and I said, why isn't this a book? And uh, fast forward to two years later and here we are. Did, do, do you know, did Carlos Baker have access to that material when he did his biography? I don't think it was together, no. Wow. no. Uh, Carlos, uh, you know, he was at Princeton. He was a poet there and he had actually been in touch with Hemingway during the last few years of his life and actually had wanted to do a literary biography, uh-huh. uh, mostly just focusing on the, um, the books. But uh, no, I think the archive itself was sort of established in the um, late 70s, maybe 1974. So no, this would have been way after Baker, who I think published his biography in 1965. Hmm. Is that right? Was it that? Well, I read it, uh, I want to say it was probably 80 or 81 when I was in college. And uh, I had only read one Hemingway story, uh, The Sun Also Rises, which was assigned. You know, I, I, read yeah. it, I read it because it was assigned. And I remember thinking that the biography, and which was huge, hundreds and hundreds of pages, yeah. it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I think it was one of the reasons that I took an interest in writing biography. Because yeah, yeah. 
he made this man's life sing in a way that I actually didn't find that the books were as interesting as the man's life. And uh, Sometimes. I, I think that's the danger is Hemingway led such an interesting life that yeah. it sometimes overshadows the work. And sometimes that interesting life, because I've spent you know two years plus with him, um, also makes him very tough to live with because he... <laughs> He was not nice, really, to any of his wives um, or how he treated them. He betrayed almost everybody who ever helped him. Um, you know, you add alcoholism and uh, chronic uh, tail spinning. We, we can say, um, you know, he was a colorful rock contour or a ball faced liar. Mm. Um, so he's a tough figure to reconcile. But I think and I hope the work still stands for on its own. What's well, interesting, one of the first things that you talk about in the book was how F. Scott Fitzgerald had recommended uh, Hemingway to uh, Scribner, his lifelong uh, publishing company, yep. even yep. before they had met. And then once they met, uh, Fitzgerald uh, had helped Hemingway, had edited his, his work, yep. and had given him things. And they started off on this great uh, uh, level. Yeah, and yeah, and then uh, then it all went sour, as it did pretty much all of Hemingway's relationships. Right, and I, I think that's also Scott's fault as well. I mean, so he did help, and he did help edit um, some of his work, which Hemingway used but then resented. Um, but the other part of this was he did not get along with Zelda. Yeah. Um, Zelda accused uh, Fitzgerald of basically having a homosexual affair with Hemingway. <laughs> Um, she questioned the size of Fitzgerald's manhood and just sort of cut him down. Hadn't she seen uh, it? Sorry, just sorry. yeah, she had. She had. <laughs> but but um, you know, it was uh, it was not an easy relationship, and um, you know, she called Hemingway a phony, and uh, later, you know, Hemingway just thought she was crazy, um, and in all the impolite ways, and and she was committed. She was uh, put in an asylum for a while. Um, and in fact, died in an asylum, burned to death in an asylum. But uh, he blamed her for Fitzgerald's uh, lack of output. Um, she liked it better. Uh, he thought that she liked it better when uh, he wasn't working because then he, she had him all to herself. Um, but of course, their lifestyle couldn't support him not working. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have the same problem. Yes. Yes. Your wife was telling me. Yeah. <laughs> hey, now. Uh... <laughs> So, uh, did you say that you spent two years kind of living in this archive? Two years, and it's it's not just one archive. It's basically four archives. Um, it's uh, the library's collection, the uh, Ernest Hemingway Foundation of Oak Park's collection. Uh, there's the birthplace, there's the museum, and there's the high school and the, what else? The um, Historical Society of Oak Park and River Forest. So a lot of different collections. And actually, in the Historical Society, we found letters that no scholars knew exist uh, existed. So um, we were just able to, right under the wire, get those into the, um, I think it's the Cambridge University editions of the Ernest Hemingway Letters Volume 3. So we were just ba barely able to sneak those in. So uh, there's a ton of material. Uh, and I, I've had I have some experience with this. I hate to use the word Eisner again, but when I did oh, yeah. the Eisner uh, biography, I spent a great deal of time at the Cartoon Art Museum archives at uh, Ohio State. That was before it became the Billy Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It was just stacks and stacks and stacks of stuff, and so I'm I was fascinated with what you did. Uh, and I should point out to people, this is a uh, coffee table book. Yeah, it's yeah. got color. It's got reproductions of a lot of the items that we're talking about and that are in the book. It's got a lot of illustrations, lots and lots of illustrations, almost every page. So my question is, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you decide? You know, how do you, how do you choose between this and that? Because obviously you had a mountain to go through. How do you decide what stays in the book and what doesn't? There's three of you working on the book. Is yeah. it a committee type of thing? How do you? Uh, I mean, part of it is what tells a story, because uh, even though it is a coffee table book, the idea is how do you tell a life story through objects? So if it told a story, if it illuminated some part of his biography or his personality, then it stayed in. The other part, which you <laughs> so sort of adeptly point out, is there's so much material. I mean, there's a there's a photo on the back of the book um, of Hemingway holding a gun. We think it's from 1918, 1917, right after he's wounded in World War One. He was a um, he was a volunteer ambulance driver for the Red Cross, American Red Cross, in World War One. No in one had ever Italy, seen that. Italy, right? 
in Italy, yeah, on the Italian front. No one had ever seen that. So I had to like cajole and blackmail my publisher to be like, this has to go in. So we kept finding things right up until pu the publication deadline. So, um, you know, it was a challenge. Uh, and I think, you know, we're going back for a second printing now. We're hmm. almost sold out of the first printing. So it's, it's been really, yeah, it's been great. But the, um, you know, there's so much material that I think uh, a second edition, um, not just a second printing, but a whole other second edition uh, will be fascinating because we have all the stuff that we keep finding. And why is there so much stuff? I mean, you, you kind of indicate, I think, in the introduction that, uh, you know, maybe they were maybe the family was hoarders. I mean, they just they, they didn't seem to throw anything away. No, no, no. I mean, uh, yeah, if we were impolite, we would say hoarders. If we were polite, we would say pack rats. <laughs> but but they were good chroniclers of their own history. And I, they got that from their father uh, and from their mother who made these elaborate scrapbooks for them um, that are actually available at the JFK Library where most of Hemingway's manuscripts are. Hmm. So, um, you know, it, it was a family compulsion. And he, you know, Sandy Spanier, uh, Sandra Spanier, uh, who was the editor of the Letters Collection, you know, I heard her speak and she said, you know, Hemingway kept every piece of page paper he ever touched. And I, if I had not been through those collections, I would have thought that was hyperbolic. And I actually think she was she was hedging her bets. I think he kept every piece of paper he ever saw. <laughs> he so much stuff. You know, I, I, I this is, uh, uh, I will admit, uh, I, I've, I've saved pretty much everything that I've ever worked on or written and yep. but I realized a couple of years ago that a I'm no Hemingway and B it's a lot of crap to lug around so I've been going through it because I decided that my kids should should never have to be burdened with all that stuff <laughs> but I realized most importantly that I was no Hemingway and there was no reason to keep all that stuff uh, and I'm gonna disagree with you I am a huge archives geek so I, one of the reasons I love this uh, this book, this project, is um, I, when I was in college, I was um, a student archivist for the author Ken Kesey. So he wrote oh, One, sure. Flew the, One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest, sometimes a great notion. Electric um, Kool-Aid. Electric Kool-Aid acid Tom Wolfe wrote a book about him. Um, and that really sort of got me um, energized. I, you know, I, I've told other people that, you know, for me, archives are a place where uh, hidden stories are waiting to be told. So I actually don't think your archive is is useless. In fact, you should find a home for it because your research, other people will um, build on that research and use that research. And you, 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 you laugh, but I am not kidding. I'm laughing yeah. because my wife, when she hears this, will laugh. But fortunately, she'll never hear this, so who cares? <laughs> well, and here, here's the other thing. If, if, if you find the, the, a right place for it, not only do you will you be of service to your community and to future scholars, but you'll also get a tax write off. So ah, let's yes. talk, let's talk about that. But, but uh, I mean, literally, like so, so you mentioned uh, one of my film books. Um, let me see, the, I think it was the second one, which is called the the best film you've never seen, where I talked to uh, movie directors about a movie that they love that has been lost or critically savaged. I was able to use stills from Pauline Kael's archive, which is at Indi Indiana University, which is where my manuscripts go. So I benefited from Pauline Kale being a pack rat. So I'm a huge advocate for people finding the right archive for their material. I'd just like to say that after I did the Eisner book, I donated a lot of stuff to the Cartoon Art Museum. Great. And then a few years later, went, uh, there was something I was curious uh, about. And uh, they said, we don't have any record of any material from you, Mr. Andelman. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you... Uh, <laughs> You need to find the right contact there because yeah. universities don't throw anything away. I think the people I dealt with are dead now. But anyway, um, so let's. So how do I mean? There were three of you. Can you kind of describe? I want to give everybody a little credit. Uh, can you describe who did what or how that how that kind of worked its way through? Sure, sure, sure. So my um, uh, I originated the idea because I was here and I was connected to the newspaper, um, and uh, my longtime uh, best friend Aaron Vetch. In fact, uh, I've been his best man twice. Um, you know, <laughs> that may not be uh, a recommendation. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, he's, he, the thing. The thing is, like, <laughs> he, he has been my collaborator and copy editor on um, uh, all six of my previous books. And and the kicker is, he's a better writer than I am. Hmm. But he had not really been published. And I finally said, okay, let's let's just do this together. Um, and so he came aboard, um, and he really focused uh, on the Petoskey, which is the Michigan. Um, 
era of the book and also bullfighting because he speaks Spanish. Um, and, uh, and then we went to the press, Kent State University Press, which has a long prestigious legacy of Hemingway books, uh, including a great one called All Man, which is about uh, Hemingway in magazines. It's a really, really great book. And, um, uh, and they said, well, great, we're happy to have you, but you need a Hemingway scholar. You need somebody who knows the community and who can you know, rattle things off the top of their head and fact check you. And so that's Mark Torino, and he has been amazing. He's a professor in Evansville and in Indiana, mm. and uh, uh, he has been uh, a wonderful sort of collaborator. And all three of us, um, you know, would do this. We would get on Skype. You know, we would get on the phone and go page by page after we had sort of collected everything together. So it was a wonderful, truly collaborative uh, endeavor. Tell us about two or three of your favorite uh, discoveries from the archives. Um, there's one that I wrote about for the Chicago Tribune, actually, and you can look this up. Uh, it's a woman, it's a poem, actually, that had been in the archives, but little known. It had been, somebody pointed out later, it had been uh, published in a scholarly journal, and it was a, uh, this love note to a woman named Annette DeVoe. And the reason this is interesting and important is a lot of his uh, contemporaries said that they never saw him with a girl and he never went on a date. He was only interested in hunting and fishing. Oh, I and, saw that in the book. Yeah. 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 And what this poem, uh, sort of proves is that that was wrong. Like not only was his interest, um, in these, he, not only did he have an interest in women, but he pursued them. He wasn't very successful, but this is very passionate poem. You're, you know, he talks about your sensuous loveliness and, you know, I would walk through hell with you. And so one of the things I did with the Chicago Tribune is I tracked down her family. Wow. So that was a lot of fun. Again, you get to sort of uh, understand him. I, I believe that you understand people better when you see them as children or teens. Um, and it just helps you understand his um, his romant his romantic life. Uh, you know, married four times. He was a man in love with love, but just couldn't quite figure out how to sustain it. There's a comment in the book relative to this, I think, where someone who was in his high school class said that, uh, I, I wish I could remember the quote, but it was something about if, if, if anyone tells you that he went to proms or dances yeah. or anything, it's not true, that all he ever cared about was hunting and fishing. Right. And, I don't know who that person was. Yeah, that, that's right. It's a woman named uh, Susan Lowry who, yeah. wrote his, um, who wrote his little high school blurb. Yeah. Okay. And then one of the things that I really liked in the book was uh, reading Agnes Van Karoski's uh, yeah. Dear John letter to, to Hemingway. I mean, that it, that was, to me, one of the greatest things to read, but it was also one of the, the, the greatest uh, invasions of privacy. I felt like, I mean, you know, I mean, he, he certainly, we know that she was the model in this book. And mm -hmm. we know that she was a major uh, figure in his life and had a great uh, impact. You could say negative and positive. But to actually yeah. read and see the letter, ooh. Yeah, yeah, the letter that sort of broke him in half. Yeah. Uh, but it's more than that. We, I think we publish, I don't know if there's five or six of them, but we publish almost all of them. And one of the things that previous scholars had pointed out or had – uh, shaped the narrative was that this was not a real love affair and you know he thought he was going to marry her in fact he told people that they were engaged and um, you know but she was seven years older than him and she was never really serious and she was more like a mother and you know and, and it was it was not real a real love affair but if you read those letters he, she's very passionate and very loving and very you know she's talking about sort of eternity with him so I, that's one of the things that I think reshapes the narratives. You know, he was in love with her, and it's easy to see how in love with him she was. So I think, you know, a lot of people who had sort of discounted her or discounted that story, I just say, just read the letters. You know, see, you know, try not to be in love with this woman, you know. Uh, so that's, that's uh, one of the other things I like. I'm really drawn to that uh, section of the book. What was there? Were there any other letters? Uh, I was just kind of winding down here, but were there any other letters that you read that made you feel like you were invading the man's privacy? That it was just a little too, you know, close. You know, no, it, because he saved everything and she saved everything, and at a certain point, especially when he was famous, he sort of knew. 
Um, he did say that he did not want any of his letters published. So the family has gone against his wishes there. Um, I think it's projected 17 volumes of letters are going to come out. I think there's going to be an 18th for letters that they may have missed. Um, but I will point out there's a lot of great literature we would have lost, um, if people's, uh, if people's wishes were uh, adhered to mostly Kafka, we would have almost no Kafka um, if, uh, is it Max Brode, uh, uh, his, his executor and his friend, uh, had abided by his wishes and burned all his material. So, um, I never felt like I was invading his privacy. And, and also, you know, I've been in archives so much, I've read far more intimate things. Ah. Uh, you know, the Ken Kesey letters are amazing and intimate and funny. Um, nowhere near the intimacy, uh, uh, in the Hemingway letters that you get with Kesey's material. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to tell the world that my letter writing ended about 1982, and uh, there were some good ones, but I don't think you'll ever see them. And my emails, it's just not as interesting. Email lives forever, so be careful. Right, it's just not that interesting. I, I never you know, put anything. I, I, so, uh, mm-hmm. Listen, uh, what? Uh, oh, well, I should ask, have you heard from any Hemingway family members about the book? Uh, you know what? I uh, spent some time with Valerie Hemingway, who was his secretary and then his um, his daughter-in-law. Uh, she was married to uh, not Patrick. Anyway, she was married to one of his, one of his uh, sons, uh, and she was lovely. She actually sort of signed my book. Uh, I have a tour copy that I take around with me, and uh, she signed it and uh, wrote me a lovely note. Uh, and she, she lives in Bozeman, Montana, and I'm from Billings, Montana, and that's about 90 miles away. And so she was saying, oh, well, come and, you know, let's do an event and whatnot. So she's been uh, very lovely and very supportive, and I have to sort of take her up on that. Um, and then I was at a, an, an event and somebody said, oh, would you, uh, sign this book for Mariel Hemingway? I was like, oh, okay. Um, and, uh, we did, but we haven't heard from her, but, uh, you know, we have a website, hiddenhemingway.com. So she's welcome to write us anytime. <laughs> That's great. So, uh, what's next? Are you going to do another Hemingway book or do you have something else, uh, in the works? You always... I would- have something in the works. Yeah, I always have five or six books going, uh, and usually three of them make it. Three of them make it to uh, fruition. So uh, I haven't inked anything yet, um, so I can't quite tell you yet. But yeah, there's at least four ideas um, and at least 70 pages of one of them done. So a year, 18 months from now, you will likely make it to the five-timer club here. Uh, yes, yes. I, I feel like it's hosting Saturday Night Live. If you, and, you know, it's like... I, I, there's no jacket yet. We haven't reached the. F- I think it, I think Saturday Night Live when you hit the fifteen, fifteen times, I think is when you get the satin jacket. So I will promise this: if any of my guests make it to fifteen appearances, I'll buy a jacket. I'll buy okay. you a satin jacket. Okay. Uh, I will aspire to to take it from you. <laughs> you and Peter Gombach and Stephen Gore, you're all in contention. Um, listen, folks, uh, you can find Robert K. Elder's new book. Hidden Hemingway Inside the Ernest Hemingway Archives of Oak Park, uh, co-authored, as he mentioned, with Aaron Vetch and Mark Serino uh, at great bookstores online, or in, you can order it at any bookstore. Uh, you can get it also at a great price right here at mrmedia.com. You know how it works. If you're watching on the site, uh, just below the video to the left or the right, you'll see a cover, the cover of the book. Click on it right now. It'll take you to Amazon. You can order it immediately and have it, I think, in like 30 minutes. I think, you know, with their uh, their drone delivery system, yes. you can have it really yeah. fast. So It's a heavy book, though, so it's going to have to be a heavy, a big drone. It'll be a big drone. I guarantee <laughs> they have a big drone. Um, that's how they deliver washers and dryers. You know, they have big drones. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about now. I've, I've seen the future, <laughs> and it is now. <laughs> Robert, uh, you mentioned that there is a specific uh, website for a Hidden Hemingway. Yeah, it's just HiddenHemingway.com. Uh, there's also a Twitter account and a Facebook page, uh, both Hidden Hemingway. Um, and the, the great thing is about those is they live sort of beyond the book. So uh, if we get subscribers to the Twitter account or to Facebook, they get to see sort of historical articles, um, uh, rare photos, things that aren't in the book, outtakes from the book. Uh, so it's a community that's sort of taken on a life of its own. Excellent. And uh, what do you think of my, my idea for Hidden Hemingway? Where you know we go around the country and find Hemingway hidden in you know maybe he's in uh, you know uh, uh, 
uh, oh my God, you know where the four presidents are built in granite. Maybe there's yeah. a little hidden Hemingway there or something. Uh, yeah, I I think we will have a lot more luck with Mickey actually, and maybe, yeah. and maybe Hello Kitty. All right, all right, it was worth a try. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe one day we'll have hidden Hillarys. Um, <laughs> All right, Robert K. Elder, always a pleasure to see you. Four Time Club, uh, thank you again so much for joining us in Mr. Media. Thanks for having me, Bob. before a studio audience full of bullfighters who think this show is already too much talk and not enough action <laughs> in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Hi, this is Rich Scheidner. And if you've ever wondered what it was like to be a stand-up comedian in the 1980s, I'm going to do you a big favor. Instead of billions of dollars for a time machine, you can just spend $24.95 and buy my new book, Kicking Through the Ashes, My Life as a Stand-Up in the 1980s Comedy Boom. It will save you money and give you thrills. It will take you there. Go to my website, richscheidner.com. Go to amazon.com and buy this book. <laughs>